Biobalance HealthCast, Episode 120, Sex and American Culture. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Today we're going to be talking about uh, dating and sex and changing cultural mores about dating and sex. And it's, <laughs> it's fascinating to look at different cultures and the way they perceive this whole issue. Uh, I have a number of European friends who say that Americans are just so childish and paranoid about <laughs> things sexual, especially for nudity and advertising. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a friend who has a young daughter uh, who is so much more casual about her dating guys and uh, when she'll become sexual in her life and whether or not those are things like if, if they take a vacation, will they take this boy with them? Right. And will they worry about things that mm -hmm. a lot of American families would be like, oh my God, call the police, that's child abuse, that's, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's I different. I can't comment on that. Yeah, well, but it's culturally different. Right, it doesn't, and, it's not child abuse. <laughs> it's just, I mean, we wouldn't consider it that. Uh -huh. I mean, that's a hyperbole, but, but it is, we still have a lot of views about sex that sex is only okay after marriage. Right. Okay. And, um, and that we should keep, uh, keep women's virginity, not necessarily men's. It's a double standard. Isn't that a crazy thing? Which is an interesting thing. Yeah. So you're supposed to marry somebody without knowing what being intimate with them is like. And then they're supposed to teach you everything you know. I mean. Or you're supposed to learn it together, I guess. But, but again, you go back to some of those fundamentalist religious concepts about sex. And sex is solely for the purpose of procreation, right. not for the purpose of pleasure, not for the purpose of intimacy or relationship enhancement. Mm -hmm. It's just so that you can have babies. And yeah. so and the, the perfunctory sexual performance for procreation is, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I, you know, I deliver the sperm and you receive it and go off and get pregnant. And it's not about any of the, the color that can be brought into the experience. It's yeah. almost like when, when you study music and they talk about the difference between uh, pure notes and quarter notes and half notes mm -hmm. and, and what gives the timber of music its richness and its flavor mm -hmm. are all the quarter and half notes around the pure notes. So you, you can't just have the pure tone. Right. Like in BC, that, that's not a song. That doesn't move anybody. Well, but, but we're talking about an article also from the New York Times. A couple different articles. A couple of different bring articles, together but but one of the art basically the theme here is that we used to think that gender roles in sex yes were set. They were they were set by genetics. They were set by um, by so so they are set by social norms. It, it's always been acknowledged that social norms do change how we feel about sex, but. It was more of a Darwinian thought that we've developed into certain the, sexual social roles. evolution, yeah. And it was, and and that that's over. It's like that's it. We're done. No more social change, right. which is clearly not. Which true. actually goes against Darwin's philosophy about yep. adaptation. But they they like Darwin. I mean, they like Darwin in this kind of role of. I mean, they're they're likening it to Darwin. Well, <laughs> but then but then they stop. And they act like, that's it, we're done. That was the end of the change in women's roles in sex and women's views, which is completely wrong because everything's changed since 1960. <laughs> well, it, uh, not just Darwin. There, there actually is a, a Harvard uh, professor named Edwin Wilson uh, who wrote a book called Sociobiology and goes back in, uh, in looking at breeding strategies and procreative strategies for survival of, of people and cultures mm -hmm. and says that men have evolved and, and, and they looked at animals as well, the breeding mm -hmm. strategies of animals. Uh, for instance, some animals the breeding strategy is to produce lots of offspring because the attrition rate is so massive. And so mm -hmm. you have 150 sea turtle eggs because only five of them are going to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then larger animals, mammals in particular, that have a breeding strategy of 
of one or two at a time mm -hmm. because the chances of survival are greater. Mm -hmm. But those are babies that need high intensity attending and well, care. Well, mammals are, are all high intensity care. Those babies don't survive. Human babies won't survive if somebody doesn't take care of them. Right. You can't just drop 50 eggs on the beach and hope one or two will make it to adulthood. Mm -hmm. And then, and so the, the levels of sophistication get, get larger. And, and so the theory is that in support of that, we develop different breeding strategies mm -hmm. and that men are genetically predisposed to be promiscuous because men are, the theory says. We've talked about that before from Men, men from are all books. about just spreading their seed everywhere they can hoping that they'll have offspring because the genetic imperative for the man is to make sure that his genes reproduce. Right. And, and the theory that the sociobiologists maintain then is that women are different We're because cheesier. the woman is the one that carries the baby and then cares for the baby in most cultures, mm -hmm. most human cultures, for so many years that she has to have a breeding strategy that promotes a life that says the man will invest in me mm -hmm. and stay with me and protect and provide for me and my offspring. And she'll take care of that offspring. But and so she is uh, they say that the the monthly estrus cycles mm -hmm. were ways in which female humans uh, evolved to keep men attentive and keep men around and keep mm -hmm. men responsive because I can't go off on a three-year sailing journey and come home and be secure and then all of a sudden some other guy hadn't been visiting and generating children <laughs> that I'm going to put Something's my resources towards supporting <laughs> and so we develop families and tribal groups to help mm -hmm make that possible. And as we've gotten more sophisticated, we don't need as many children to keep the race going. We used to need 10 children and maybe three would make it to adulthood after we didn't have immunizations, yeah. clean water, we didn't have, you know, we worked in the field, the child, we had mortality accidents and, and many infants died because we didn't have good OB care. I mean, we didn't have any OB care. So, so all of those things apply to way back when, when right. society wasn't as advanced as it is now. Economics have changed. We're right. not agriculturally based, and so we don't need 12 kids for the family farm to generate enough physical labor to grow enough food to feed us. I thought that was interesting in this article. They talked about, we, we always feel like um, we have all the choices in the world to find our mate, mm -hmm. okay? And so he went to the reality of it because in early U.S., when in any agrarian culture, you live on a lot of land mm -hmm. and you're separated from other people and towns are small. And so women would have a choice of maybe five men to marry if they were going to stay in that town. There were probably five men in her age group or in that range that were possibilities. And so th those were her choices. And that's a matter of proximity. Proximity People is couldn't fly and drive and... You yeah. couldn't marry somebody from China because you couldn't. You were never going to be there. Well, on the American you know? frontier in, in the 1700s and 1800s, they had a, a cultural uh, custom called bundling, because it was so far and so dangerous to go to your girlfriend's farm. You know, maybe 20 mm -hmm. miles away when you had to walk that 20 miles or ride a horse yeah. through the woods where the Indians might mm -hmm. get you. Uh, so you'd have to stay over. <laughs> and they didn't have oh, right. facilities for you to stay over. Laura Ingalls Wilder, I remember that. So they take these guys and these girls and they would bundle them, which means they'd tie them up together mm -hmm. and put them in bed for in the same room where the rest of the family slept. Yeah, because everybody slept so together. So they could snuggle and whisper and talk but and they be couldn't aroused, do anything but they else. couldn't do anything about it. At least that was the, Supposedly. the custom. And a woman who would bundle wasn't looked at as a woman who uh, was of easy virtue. Well, her parents were sleeping Because there. her parents were right there, yes. Uh, so, but you had to do that to sort of say, is this somebody that might be a reasonable mate catch? But again, most of those decisions were family decisions mm -hmm. that were based around economics. Right, who got the land? Who got the who land, who inherited the property, to? who owned the stuff? People didn't marry for love. Yeah. And they so, didn't marry for attraction or mental equality or emotional equality or the, the anything. The concept it of just, love marriage evolved out of the Industrial Revolution. Right. When people began to make their money as salary and not as farm-based land-owned property. And they lived in cities. They moved into cities. And they had much more exposure to many other mates. started 
dating, and it, and it, it actually mm -hmm. coincided with the development of a stage of life called adolescence. Because yeah. in primitive cultures, you're a child or you're a grown-up, and you go through mm -hmm. rites of passage once you become able to have children. You, you test for admission to adult status, mm -hmm. and then you get married and you have babies and you, you have short lifespan and it's gone. But in societies where you live longer and in societies where our children can procreate, but they're not ready to support themselves. They're they not ready. They aren't even done being adolescents at 30. I'm not sure how, when the date oh is now, God. but, but every, I used to think, <laughs> when, I, when I was 12, my mom kind of went, oh, make your own clothes and um, I'll see ya. Basically, well, she didn't, you know, it wasn't like a caretaking thing because she hadn't grown up that way. She was working and doing things to support the family at 12. So she kind of thought that I was on my own. And so I had the misconception that when my beautiful, intelligent, high maintenance daughter turned 12, <laughs> that she would like, she'd take care of herself. But that, that's not what happens now. And, and that's good because that was scary to be dumped out of, you know, basically dumped out of the family caretaking and say, say you know, if you need something, call me, but. <laughs> I lived independently. I left my father's home at 17. I, know. I supported myself totally at 17. I got married at 19. I have a 17 year old. I look at him <laughs> and I think there's no way in hell that he could live independently now. And, and you wouldn't want himself. him to. Oh, and I don't want him to. It's, and I don't want him married at 19. And I don't want him getting some girl pregnant at 19. Right. And, and that's also changed things. All right. You know, we now have birth control that gives women a lot more control. It also gives them control over if they want to procreate with someone because birth control pills aren't seen. Mm -hmm. So if they use birth control pills and nothing else and they want to their partner catch may or may not catch, know. Catch a guy. Yeah. <laughs> the, so the guys really are at their mercy. Yes. Because now men don't just go, oh, see ya. Now there's a legal, there's a legal uh, obligation to fathering a child, which there should be. Yes. But but that makes them at risk for women who may not want to tell them that they don't have birth control because the women think they're a great catch. Yes. So I mean. They, there's a, there's always been deceit in love. That's just the way it works now. That's the kind of deceit that it, it's changed hands. It used to be the men who held most of the cards. Now I'm starting to see that that More the equity. women hold the cards. But I don't think that this is good equity. Sometimes equity is you know that this is kind of evil equity. Mm. I mean I don't approve of it and I don't agree with it. But that's what's happened. Well, so let's stretch the frame on this conversation for a minute. There are changes that make it possible for men and women to have more freedom of choice, that are less culturally bound definitions of, of what's permissible in terms of dating, what's framed in terms of the economic survival of a, mm -hmm. of a family or a culture. And so sons and daughters coming of age today have choice matrices that are different from any other generation that's ever existed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a, a teenage daughter, which you have mm -hmm. had, and a teenage son, which I have had, have whole different frames of reference about promiscuity. Uh, for, for 20 years I taught high school, and 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> but children then practice what we call serial monogamy. They would have, and, and I would give parent talks, and I would talk about, you know, to the parents about the fact your teenagers are sexually active. <laughs> and you may want to bury your head in the sand and say, oh, my God, yeah. you know, say it ain't so, but it is so. And uh, the, the standard is becoming that teenagers try out sex with each other, and it's not such a big deal. Uh, to them, that it was to previous generations. And this doesn't mean every child, so don't go, you know, lock well, your child in the room. It, it doesn't mean every child. It doesn't every child mean every doesn't child, do but it, it doesn't mean innocent little Betsy or innocent little Tommy don't have exposure to pornography, uh, to mm. sexually explicit media, to being marketed in our culture for arousal and then have no place to go with it. Mm -hmm. They have places to go with it. And they are in their cohort more open and casual mm -hmm. to different experimentation things that 
that would horrify so many adults. I mean, I remember doing parent groups <laughs> does where they adults. were horrified about what we called rainbow parties. Oh, okay, we aren't doing and that. And I won't specifically expl- talk about that. <laughs> we talk but about that. But those kids were like, oh, yeah, that happens. And their parents were horrified. There's a big cost to this that no one really thinks about. I mean, in some ways, knowing what you're getting into in sex in terms of a relationship is one thing. This is an entirely opposite thing where you devalue sex so much that it no longer binds you to someone. It no longer forms a spiritual there's and a real risk physical there. bond. And that this generation, if there's as many as you tell me, I, I did the other part. I took care of the girls that came in and had never had sex when we were getting married and were, and were you know, had kept themselves from, from having sex, had, had denied that in their lives until they get married, that's a whole nother adjustment because they had denied that feeling so long that it was hard for them to to release it under the right circumstances. But I mean, I was looking at that and girls that come in pregnant early and have, and and their mothers come with them and they think it's perfectly fine that they're having a baby and they're not getting married and they're not, you know, the the father's not involved or is involved. So, but the fact that these kids aren't valuing the power of sex bothers me. It's almost like the pendulum went too far the issue, because there's a huge power in the sex. The issue is the, the freedom, the technology, the exposure changes so much more quickly than the cultural standards do. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have a cultural frame that models the importance of intimacy, that models the importance mm-hmm. of having uh, a moral standard to live by, where where parents don't talk to children about how do you respect yourself? How do you make good choices? Mm-hmm. How do you make safe choices? Because these options for consumption and exposure now exist mm-hmm. in ways that they never did before. And, and so the, the challenge is to find the balance part as a family and as a culture because as, as a therapist, working on the other end of the spectrum with people that have been in relationships or married for a long time and their marriages are falling apart because the intimacy component of sex uh, is, is going away. How do we help people medically, uh, psychologically, counseling, develop the capacity to have healthy sexual intimacy and to improve the quality of their sex life and, right. and to have self-respect but freedom of choice you know Mm -hmm. you don't have to have sex with somebody in order to survive or be safe or because you married them or because you have to get out of the house or because you have to get out of the house (laughs) yeah yeah as a teenager trying Mm -hmm. to to go away uh and and now and the reason we gave you that history lesson about (laughs) sex was because you have the same bodies now at 12 to 16 as the cavemen had and as the nomads had and right. when they were getting married at 12 and 13 I mean that was normal well because their they, life experience was 30 right so they were getting married as soon as they could have sex and procreate so right. that libido starts then and then we get into a society where we don't get married till we're 30 so that's a long time the, the average age to of deny totally independent living now for our children in this culture is what? 27 <laughs> 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 so and ah! and so and also the average age for first marriages is now late 20s 26 right. 27 right so if you're waiting that long to get married and then and you're waiting that long to have sex that's a long time well but they're to not deny, but some are but most are not okay we can <laughs> most are not and so the yeah. cultural value right. has to adjust to account for that I mean, we have discussions in our home. I have an older son who's 40 and not married. Uh, if he comes to visit and brings his girlfriend, do we have boundaries in our house about, well, you're not married? He's 40. <laughs> yeah, he's 40. So, because we have a 17-year-old. I know. And I know. we're saying to the 17-year-old, the you're not going to be doing this in our house to right. the best that we can mm-hmm. stop you, mm-hmm. which doesn't mean you're not going to be doing it. Right. Because 17-year-olds I think today, the answer is you... I mean, my answer was, you have to give them your values, you have to tell them what you think, and then you have to give them the room to make the mistakes that they have to make because you don't want them making them when they're 40 years old after they've been married for a long time and they decide, ooh, I didn't learn enough, I didn't have experience. Right. I mean, to stifle them is not right. Somewhere in between stifling and caring for them is the proper place 
for the parent to be. And, but not being surprised. I couldn't agree with you more. Surprised, but you don't want to be caught unaware and you don't want to have your child. I mean, I had tons of kids, tons of girls that were very nice girls that went to Catholic schools. And I mean, one year I had 18 kids up for adoption. 18 girls that got pregnant whose mothers said they're not having sex, who didn't let them get birth control, right. who had babies. Yeah. I mean, these little girls didn't know anything. No one taught them sex so, education. So, so, so the they, summative point here is pay attention to your children. Share your values. Communicate. Teach. Be aware. And then help protect them from themselves, knowing that they have a very un unbelievable libido in their teens. And you're not the only teacher in your child's life their exposure, I mean, I can guarantee that my son is not going to see pornography in my house because I control the media, <laughs> yeah. but they have their own media. I mean, talk to your children, look at what's on your kid's cell phone, look at what's on their iPad, look at what's on their computer, know where they go, check their websites, mm -hmm. because it's dangerous. I saw a study the other day that said uh, something like one out of seven adolescent girls has met a stranger that they've met over the now internet. That's what's dangerous. I mean, that's and, not And the, so if uh, the technology is so explosively beyond what you might even be aware of, and I, and I talk to parents who don't know how to check what photographs are on, or what music mm -hmm. is on their kid's cell phone. They don't know how to do it. Go to the Apple store. They'll tell you how to do it. But you need <laughs> to do it because you are not the only teacher in your child's life, and you are not the only avenue for information and access to things that are dangerous Prepare for them. Prepare for the worst and hope for the best. But also <laughs> talk to them and model. You are the model that they look at and know that your behaviors, if you're single and you're dating, what is your child learning? Uh, if, if you're interacting with your husband or wife, I, I, and I ask this question in therapy all the time, what did you learn from your mother about men? What did you learn, the way to treat men, the way to speak to men, the way to conceptualize men? Because she's going to be looking for what you've taught her to look for, either mm -hmm. plus or minus, either, oh, my God, I don't want, you know, how many times you grow up and say, I'm not going to become my mother. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, are. then she keeps creeping in in the mirror. Yeah, yeah, and then you do. So, so the point of, I guess, our conversation today is just to be aware that there's so much out there in our culture that is changing, in part because of media and media exposure, and in part because of medicine mm -hmm. and changes in what's available medically, and in part because of economics, the, the freedom mm -hmm. to not be landlocked. Right. So it's so it's much amazing. more important that you pay attention, that you are aware, that you are actively involved in your children's life, and that you think about and talk to them about what are your values, what are your standards for dating, for sex, for procreation, uh, for consumption of media. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the statistics are starting to tell us, you know, we used to think that men were so visually stimulated and that men were the oh, only yeah. consumers of yeah. pornography. Men are not. And I mean, now women the only ones are the leading stimulated. consumers of pornography in, uh, in the media. Well, I mean, they, I mean, they used to say that at church camp. The boys could wear anything. Like, they could wear little yeah. shorts. Yeah. Like, nothing. And no shirts. And yeah. they could... They could prance around with nothing on, but the girls in 100 degree weather had to wear sleeves and a ne high neck yeah. and shorts that were long, and they were dying of the heat. And these guys are prancing around. Well, the girls are just as visually stimulated. And, and I could not get that through to the Christian counselors that, you know, you got to cover the boys up. Yeah. I mean, if you want to do it this yeah. way, you got to cover the boys up too. Stalking around without a shirt on. Right, and don't yeah. yell at the girls and embarrass them about a shirt with no sleeves when the boys walking around with gym shorts that are that big. Yeah. I mean, it was a huge double standard and probably still is in that same Probably camp. still is. So um, nobody listens to me. I mean, in that kind of, in that way, because, but but it's true and there have been studies now that could back me in my, in my um, documentation of this that Visual women are visually stimulated. That's, I mean, in fact, that's how we're initially attracted to people. That and pheromones. Pheromones, yeah, the pheromones yeah. that you can't see. So, so the end of the day, pay attention, be aware, stay in your own skin, focus on intimacy in your relationships. But intimacy involves attending. And and love your adolescent child, no matter how unlovable they are. A lot because of there's still that. A lot of that's child. a mask. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's a complex situation, and 
Good luck. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.